and the purpose of the panel is to kind of explore issues having to do with the contemporary crisis in Latin America. And what we set out to do in our particular work, Humana and myself, was to look at what we would call an emancipatory scenario or scenarios. You know, what are the ways out of the sort of crisis that sets in uh, during the neoliberal consolidation throughout the region. Essentially what we do is lay out a path which I think leads towards, for example, experiences like in Venezuela and in Bolivia. Hey, come on in folks. I know the elevator thing, so just, there's seats back in that corner, just a few. Um, sorry. What we uh, basically analyze are some of the sort of uh, letdowns, what we call the sort of missed opportunities and letdowns, and we include in that uh, Lula's experience in Brazil. So we try to we do kind of a critical reading of the experience of the Lula administration. And we also are even more critical, of course, as you might imagine, of the Chilean Socialist Party concertation, concertation experience in, uh, in Chile, um, who of course got voted out of office. And Jimenez is going to focus entirely on the topic of Chile, so I won't say anything more about that. But um, we look at these scenarios of where the left and the center left had um, either been in electoral power or had been strong forces um, organizing over the last maybe 15 years, we emphasize. We do talk about Cuban socialism and, and some older experiences, Nicaragua and Sandinista Revolution, um, and also some of the weaknesses that we saw in each of the scenarios. So without trying to present the whole book in five minutes or less, what I would suggest is that we come to several kind of uh, general conclusions of the elements that we feel are necessary for a transformation, progressive transformation in Latin American developing countries. And we would sort of include the following. First of all, strong social movement, intersectoral alliances provides kind of like the motor for social transformation from our point of view. We feel that change comes from the grassroots it's, you know, as we're sort of seeing the, the uh, Arab version right now kind of unfold, very contradictory social movements, social classes, you know, that are very complex in their formations when they organize. You have public sector unions on the defensive, organizing their interests. You have, of course, the women's movement, ecological movements. You have student movements. You've got anti-war movements, anti-U.S. based movements, a lot of anti-movements, a lot of no-to movements, not so many yes-to movements. Okay, given the sort of you know collapse of the Latin, of the world left, I guess you could say since probably you know the period of the end of the Cold War was certainly let's say an ideological challenge for the left in many ways, and that's a whole other issue we only brush upon. But we talk more in detail about them. So what are the elements besides social movements? Because in many ways social movements are not complete historical kinds of forces. What we basically have is a scenario where the rules of the game have to be somehow changed. That means a constitutional assembly, that means reforming the legal order. The rule of law as it's currently and typically touted works against social change from our point of view. Which means to say that a constituent assembly, a constitutional assembly is necessary to enable a progressive force, if they achieve power through electoral means, to restructure the rules of the game. We have seen that take place now in Ecuador, in Bolivia, in Venezuela. We've also seen similar kinds of legal sort of uh, you know reforms take place in other countries where it didn't really pan out into a broader social transformational trajectory. For example, in Colombia, in Peru, where and we analyze those examples of why they didn't work out very well. Like you know the M eighty nueve. M19 that had, had sort of collapsed in Colombia, but sort of threw everything they had into a, a constitutional reform. And for those of you familiar with the situation in Colombia, you can see that that didn't, that didn't really kind of pan out, um, and certainly in the ways that they had dreamed of. And in Peru, um, and in other examples of legal reforms, you have to have, in a sense, a strong social movement powering the transformation with legal change coming about as a popular demand. People have to be involved, as they were in Colombia, I would add, okay, in a fairly progressive constitutional document. But again, that wasn't enough to affect social change. So what we have, of course, is the role of political parties. We talk about how many political parties have been decimated by neoliberalism. That is to say, the traditional bases became undermined. And as a result, uh, political parties were kind of in disarray, and you have these sort of independent, charismatic figures that take, you know, take the stage, and that can be, let's say, anybody from Fujimori, 
who had, by the way, got a fair amount of leftist votes, by the way, okay, when he came to power electorally in Peru and then proceeded to do his, you know, Fuji shock and, you know, Fuji Alto Golpe and everything else, and turned out, of course, and ends up, ends up where he belongs, of course, behind bars. Basically, you have, um, in a sense, the possibility where these charismatic figures in their own right can become very reactionary forces, you know, Lucio Gutierrez in Ecuador and, and other examples. Then, of course, you have other charismatic figures like Hugo Chavez, where I might imagine that many left sort of analysts at the time when Hugo, Hugo Chavez came to power really were pretty critical and didn't see it going at least in the direction where it eventually did. And although I would say in a, in a net basis, and Jimena might, might want to dispute this later, I mean, I think we're, we're pretty strongly pro-Chavista. We're pretty strongly uh, pro um, Venezuela in, ten, in terms of, of the overall context. There are certain serious issues to be resolved in the sense of the attempts to form a more direct popular democracy from below and how that interfaces with an extraction-based development model. So we try to tie together things like development model dynamics, the, econ the economics that powers an economy forward and how that relates to you know, the sort of political currents, the radical political currents. I think right now I, I was just at a conference in New Orleans, and one of the one of the questions came up about Hugo Chavez and his, you know, fairly strong historical support of, of Gaddafi, for example. So it posed certain challenges, you know, for the left that we could probably talk about. I think in the discussion, not to monopolize my role as chair and take all the time of this panel. So um, there are other uh, aspects to our kind of scenario, but in general, what we see is, uh, of course, the powerful indigenous movement in Bolivia becoming a powerful motor for transformation in the Bolivian context. I'm going to have to hang up on my student finally. And, um, and other examples where we think, for example, socialism of the 21st century offers real possibilities for a way out. So in a sense, that was the kind of inspiration of our book, um, Latin America After the Neoliberal Debacle, and we take it today as kind of a point of departure for the presentations to talk about a variety of issues. So I think what we want to do then is going in order, uh, move to uh, actually to Jimena, since we're sort of already implicated uh, as a as a twosome. And Jimena is going to focus specifically on one particular case, that is the case of Chile. Okay, being that Jimena is from Chile, was part of the Salvador Allende government before it later forced into exile, um, and is now back uh, living in Chile. So I'll let her speak for herself. So many people around the world have heard speak of Chile as a sort of a miracle and as a sort of a case to be replicated. And uh, the reason I'm here today is to uh, warn that uh, Chile is not that kind of a miracle. In, in, uh, uh, the truth is that this <coughs> showcase for neoliberalism has failed completely and that we should not replicate the, the model. Uh, as you probably know, uh, we now have elected a right-wing businessman as a president and he has been touring Europe and also the United States, yes, because he went to negotiate film rights, movie rights uh, um, to California. Uh, he's that kind of president. Uh, he coined a slogan that is, do it the Chilean way. And he goes around the world saying, do it the Chilean way. We are the best, copy us, please copy us. And there's even a bunch of people, a big bunch of people for the last mm, 20 years that are making a living on teaching how to do it the Chilean way. They are teaching, for example, how wonderful our, our education system is, how wonderful our social security system is, and that links with Jim Russell's presentation. So we've been selling the know-how on neoliberal social services. That's one of Chile's uh, best uh, know-hows. Anyway, so my thesis is that Chile is neither democratic nor developed. Because we tend to speak about Chile after the dictatorship, Chile during democracy, there's no such thing as democracy in Chile now for several reasons. And the first reason, and that links with something that Ricardo was saying, 
is that we do not have a democratic constitution. What we have is a, a, a military decree uh, from 1980, from the time of Pinochet, that is our constitution, that rules us up to this day. The democratic politicians that started ruling us from 1990 onwards, from this coalition party called La Concertación, the consultation, that would yes. be consultation. Yeah, La Concertación have refused to change the constitution, not even undemocratically, because they could have, you know, hired a bunch of technicians and written a new constitution and then mm, discussed it. But no, not even that. So I belong to a movement that uh, is demanding a constitutional assembly because uh, we don't believe in a technocratic constitution, we believe in the democracy that comes from the people. Um, it's been very tough. We have so far not found uh, presidential candidates that will back our proposal uh, or that have any chance of really uh, being uh, potentially elected candidates. The other reason why we are not democratic is because this constitution ties in a very flawed electoral system. And this electoral system says who uh, uh, the first one wins all. So we, only the two majority parties can have seats in parliament, can have, of course, the presidency, etc., etc., and all the other tendencies have no possibility of representation. Only um, last year did the Communist Party manage to negotiate with the Concertación that they could put in um, candidates for parliamentarians in those uh, areas of the country where the Concertación didn't have uh, a possible candidate, or in those local governments when the Concertación knew they could not win. So just last year, uh, for the first time, we have three communist parliamentarians, but we don't notice any change. I mean, there's no possibility for them to change anything. Because this decree that governs us says that to change any law, to change any situation, you need such high quorums that there's no way that even the concertación <laughs> could pass a law through, could pass a change. Now, what we do have, though, is the uh, dictatorship supporters turned into political party who have a large share of the votes in the parliament. So uh, we are the only country where a dictatorship or a group of people supporting a dictatorship turned into political party and has still the real power. During the Concertación, what happened is that behind our backs, the Concertación <laughs> negotiated with these people to be able to have access to power. And so they were there, and what did they do? Uh, caged into what the Constitution allowed them, uh, they did the same thing. So we now have this so-called democracy of this so-called some people call it center-left, I call it center-right coalition, and they are doing exactly the same as the dictatorship did, everything. Repressive laws and everything. So uh, this is what uh, we, we really have. Well, the other thing about our constitution is that it locks neoliberalism in. Constitutions normally don't say what kind of development model you have to have or what kind of economic uh, uh, tendency has to rule the government. Well, the, our constitution does. So neoliberalism is there to stay while we have that decree governing us. Um, it imposes the same terrorist, anti-terrorist laws that the dictatorship imposed. That's why the Mapuche Indians are being uh, harassed, imprisoned, killed, tortured, children included. So 
Uh, is this a democracy? It, it, it's not. It, it cannot be called that. They don't have access to f fair trials. So the anti-repressive laws that don't allow us to go and protest, to demand our rights. We are harassed, repressed, imprisoned, tortured, you name it. This constitution guarantees freedom of choice on everything. You are free in my country. But there's no way to uh, guarantee your access to those choices. So, for example, it does not guarantee the right to education, but it does guarantee the right to do business on education, <laughs> to turn education into a business. So if you're an individual and want to make a living, you go into the education sector, they will subsidize you, and uh, you will have a school, and your school will be your business, and nobody's education. Uh, the political parties in, in Chile are getting more and more distant from their bases. So there's something like out of space, you know, it, very different to what people are thinking or to what people's needs are. There's no correlation between the politicians that get elected with this flawed electoral system and the people. And that is keeping the young people away from registration. Young people are not registered. So the, the political um, uh, uh, exercise in Chile is very, very limited right now. N needless to, stay, to say that the dictatorship and the contestacion after it, after it have destroyed the unions. So the unions are no force anymore. It used to be at the unions where we would educate ourselves politically, that doesn't exist anymore. Unions are fighting for little demands, uh, punctual demands, maybe a few cents more of salary, but they forget the benefits, they forget the whole context of the country, they forget a constitution, they forget the bigger issues. Either they forget or they're not allowed to even mention them. And then um, the left is completely atomized. We are really lost. We don't know what to do, except that we need a new constitution. And then, of course, we will need the mechanisms to guarantee that that constitution can be applied, of course. But uh, we have to start by agreeing on what we want as a constitution and agreeing on uh, how to go about it. Because it's very difficult. Our current decree tells us we cannot have plebiscites. The people cannot be consulted on anything. So how are we going to do it? Well, we tried in the past elections to mark the votes. The, vote, the votes can be marked, and they don't become annulled. So when we voted, we have to vote for somebody and added constitutional assembly now. And it was, theoretically, it had to be counted. But it was a very young movement, and we got very few people who dared mark the vote because people were afraid the, their votes would be annulled. So now we're discussing, what do we do? Do we do a political party? that It's the constitutional assembly political party. What do we do? We're uh, figuring it out. Um, I myself am proposing several constitutional assemblies at a level where we can do them, which is uh, city councils. City councils. Say, and say, say we manage to get constitution, constitutional assemblies on the city constitution, not on the country constitution. Say we get 30, 40, 50 of them, and then we have some strength to show and say, if we've done it in 50 communities or 50 cities, or now we demand it be done in the country. But, you know, we are trying to figure out how to go about it, and we don't know yet. Then, of course, there's a revolving door between the elected officials and big business. 
every time more. The Concertación uh, was no saint. And um, the current government is certainly much uh, worse, even worse. So that's so much for democracy in Chile. Now, the other thing is that we pretend to be very developed. We don't want to hear about Latin America. For example, our book in La for, on Latin America that Richard was talking about, it won't be published in Chile. You know, we have a Spanish version. We need, uh, I wanted a Chilean publisher. They said, no, not only do Chileans not read anymore, but we don't care about Latin America. We're Europeans. We are members of the OECD, the only <coughs> developing country that is a member of the ODCE. So uh, that's what uh, Chile is. So we believe we are the most developed country uh, in Latin America. We believe we are special. And that's why our president goes around saying, do it the Chilean way. But we have a development model based on the extraction and export of natural resources. Our main product is copper. So mining makes up most of our exports. Um, the, the development model is based on privatization and the market for the poor. So education, health, pension system, everything is privatized. You have to go to the market for it. But we have the state, what is left of the state, for the rich, for uh, investment um, business people. So the state reduces their taxes as long as they will invest, or um, uh, gives them special benefits, or allows them to do things nobody would be allowed to do. Like they're discussing now when we're waiting for President Obama now to come, because we are discussing in foreign investment in nuclear power. In the country that is the most seismic country in the world, where in 1960 we had the number one earthquake in humanity, and where last year, in February 2010, we had the number five strongest earthquake in humanity, only one notch lower than the Japan uh, earthquake. And we're going to discuss investment on nuclear power with President Obama. I hope Obama is intelligent enough to have changed his agenda, because we are going to fry him when he re reaches Santiago if he keeps on that agenda. We are all prepared for that. We still believe that um, growth is development, of course. And you, uh, as I hope you know, growth isn't development, especially not this growth based on natural resource depletion. What happens with our um, with our uh, mining system is that it's almost all in the hands of foreigners. What the state does is it gives away the mines. Say you come in and say, I'm going to invest. OK, we'll give you what you want, copper. Do you want gold? Uh, you can have it, free of cost. Whether you mine it or not, you own it so you can sell it at the market price. Uh, if you decide to exploit it, you can repatriate your gains. So you appropriate not only uh, the let's say pluralia, the yeah uh, of uh, of uh, workers' labor. You also appropriate the mining rent, and you are allowed to export all that. You're charged a, a little royalty. It's the smallest in all of the mining countries. You compare them to the ones in Australia. Uh, they are the smallest, but then they get deducted from your taxes. So it's really uh, a scam. So we give away our natural resources, and what remains in the country is that, that um, fake royalty and uh, the cost of labor. 
which is lower and lower, and where unions have been busted, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, oh, and the other thing is, we of course do not process the minerals in Chile. Uh, our main export product is copper. <laughs> and when you mine copper, you get, on the side, you get gold and molybdeno, uh, which are very valuable. Uh, and then you, you just take them away. And instead of refining copper before exporting it, it goes out as concentrate, which is uh, uh, very, which has very low degree of <coughs> copper inside. It's mostly dust, you know, with about 33%, I think it is, of copper, when we could have uh, refined it. Allende told us that copper was Chile's salary. Now, our development and our future was based on copper, because that's the wealth we have. So he used to call it Chile's salary. When um, Allende was in power, this was, you remember, it was 1970, 1973. In 1971, he managed to nationalize all copper. All copper, 100% of copper mining became Chilean. Today, only 26% of copper mining is Chile, Chilean. Everything else is in the hand of foreign investors because it's so profitable to invest in Chile on mining with the kind of governments and with the kind of rules that we have. It was denationalized by Pinochet in 1981 exactly 10 years after Allende uh, had nationalized it. <laughs> the, the other thing about copper is that this military decree that I've been talking about says that 10% of the sales price of all copper that is sold abroad uh, not of the transnational, but of that 26% that we still own, goes straight to the military. Straight to the military. It doesn't go through public budget. It's theirs by right. Which means uh, the social sector budget is lower and, and, and lower. And, and I think we have not denationalized that 26% that we still have left only because the military would be poorer. <laughs> if the military wouldn't be interested in that, I'm sure we would have nothing. Now, they pretend to convince us that we need foreign investment in copper mining, but the truth is that what the, the foreigners invested between 1974 and 2005, which is a long time, it's what, 30 years, sort of, yeah? So what they invested um, was $9.8 billion. And in, 1920, uh, in 2006, foreign company revenues for one year was $20 billion. So in all these years, they invested, say, half of what they took away in one year. So it's the biggest lie that they tell every Chilean, oh, no, we need foreign investment. <laughs> we don't need foreign investment. We, with those revenues, if they were ours, we could invest everything we needed. Now, everybody remembers the miners? Oh, these weren't copper miners, they were coal miners. Um, I was going to tell a story about the miners and then I forgot it. <laughs> well, I'll remember, I'll remember later, yeah.
The other thing is that because we because so much copper is exported and so much money comes into the country uh, with that from copper, so, so many dollars come into the country from copper, our, um, we have excess dollars. So the dollar price goes down. Well, it's going down all over the world because you know the dollar is crumbling. But in Chile, it goes down worse than in other countries. Why? Because there's too much. You know, the law of the markets, demand and uh, demand and supply. Supply. Uh, we have a, an excess supply of dollars, so our money goes up. The Chilean peso goes up, and that kills any other possible industry or exporting enterprise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because everything becomes too expensive and it cannot compete outside. So copper is really um, working against us, the way we're managing it, in many ways. The other thing is, uh, you know the petrol producing companies have this OPEC thing, and they, well, they're in turmoil right now, but they tend to uh, manage copper pr uh, petrol prices, and they mm, look at the supply, and they produce more, or they produce less, and they decide on this. Well. We, the Chileans, produce are the biggest exporter of copper in the world, and we don't, of course, we don't belong to CPEC. It only existed during the Allende times, uh, which is a sort of OPEC for copper. Uh, but also, we don't manage the international price. It's uh, foreign companies that manage it, and foreign companies always want to make a profit fast. So let's produce copper, even if the price goes down. Okay, well, the thing is that uh, GDP in our country, so um, growth in our country is high normally, except for the crisis when it went it collapsed, but it collapsed for a couple of years. It's high, but it, um, it's mainly based on extraction of natural resources. So we are so proud we have big, high G GDP, but we are uh, committing suicide because these are not renewable resources. So we are destroying the environment happily while we grow. But what are the main social consequences of these things that I've been telling you about? Do you know what Gini is, the disparity measurement um, unit? Well, there are only five countries in the world that have a worse Gini than we do. Of course, we don't tell the story, but if we go into the UNDP manuals and the yearly book of the Regional Commission for Latin America, there are only five countries in the world, quite a few are in Latin America, but in the world that have worse Gini than we do. And there are another five countries that have the same Gini that we do. All the rest of the countries have better genies. That's what Chile is, really. Because what counts is disparity. What counts is disparity. If we were all sort of semi-poor, we would all be the same, we would be happy. But how can we be happy when so few have so much and most people have little or nothing? So that's what happens with uh, GDP. Now, the latest uh, Latin American yearly book that the UNDP did has done something really weird for the UNDP, which is divided the population by classes, by classes. I thought the word class was not non-existent in the UNDP, but still, they did it in Latin America. And they have decided that the country with the worst class disparity is Chile. Why? Because it has the largest lowest class <coughs> with 55% of the population. It has an average middle class with 35% of the population. We used to be famous years ago because we were the country of the middle class. And we were sort of happy. So now we have average middle class. We don't, we're not the largest middle class country. But we have the smallest upper class in the whole of Latin America. So we have the largest class disparity in Latin America, according to uh, 
to UNDP. But the problem is, the worst disparities is within that uh, upper class. So disparities are really humongous. If we uh, work with the 1% richest and with the 1% poorest, which of course that statistic does not exist. Between 1990 and 2000, which would be large part of the concertación period, the 5% richest went from being 110 times richer than the poorest 5% to being 220 times richer. And that was um, 10 years, in 10 years. The 5% richest went from being 110 times richer than the poorest 5% to being 220 times in 10 years. In 2006, the richest 10% um, uh, richest 10% with incomes 53 times higher than poorest 10%. In 2009, it was 78 times higher. In 2006, the richest of the rich makes 97,600% more income than the richest of the poor 10%. So it's not the poorest of the poor, it's the richest of that 10%, but the richest of rich. That's the difference, 97,600% more than the richest of the lower 10%. But in 2009, that went up to 220,000% more. That's the kind of figures we're talking about when we talk about disparities in Chile. Well, we have the highest um, def defense expenditure in Latin America. Uh, this is the kind of record that Chile has. Okay, I'm going to... Uh, wrap it up. Uh, you know, Allende said copper should make Chileans rich, but in 2006, 30% of the Chileans were under the poverty line, 80% with no savings capabilities and deep into debt, and the worst poverty, of course, was concentrated with the Mapuche people in the south of the country, those that are fighting to recover their own land and being murdered and imprisoned. <coughs> in 2009, the thing got worse, so now 40% of Chilean are with incomes lower than uh, the average. Poverty grew twice as fast as the population, and extreme poverty grew three times as fast. This is also UN figures. Now, we know that the situation is a lot worse <laughs> because we have found out that the Chilean state lies about poverty figures because poverty is calculated with a, regarding the purchase ability of a basket of basic needs, and the, uh, poverty is being calculated with the cost of that basket uh, in 1985. And from 1985 now, there's been a lot of inflation in between. So uh, it's, they are fake poverty figures. So what do, you, do we think we need? I think by now <laughs> you've gathered it, we need a new constitution. I work in this movement for a, for, a, for a constitutional assembly. So we need a new constitution, but not a technocratic one, a popular one, one developed by the people. And we, we have come up with a sort of a minimal agenda for change. Of course, the constitutional ag ag uh, assembly will come with a more sophisticated agenda, but we need to overcome neoliberalism as well as capitalism. We need to stop alliances with the extreme right. If anybody is in the center, it should move left and not right. Um, we need to recover our natural resources so that we can regain our Chilean salary, as Allende called it. We need to diversify the economy and protect the environment while doing it. We need to invest in our own development instead of in 
U.S. Treasury bonds that get devaluated. That's what we do. Any surplus comes to this country and we buy U.S. Treasury bonds. Can you believe it? Instead of creating jobs, instead of paying for education and not having to privatize education for everybody, when I studied, well, it was ages ago, but I studied, I'm an architect, I studied architecture for free. I didn't have to pay anything. Now, from secondary school, most primary schools too, education is paid and privatized in Chile. And we save a lot of money in treasury bonds. What do you think of that? It's incredible. So we need to invest in our own development instead of in devaluating dollars. We need to reform a regressive fiscal system. The poor pay more than the rich, actually. We need to educate people well. We need to eliminate dictatorial anti-terrorist laws that impede us from going out into the street and saying what we believe. And uh, we need a constitutional assembly that will enable this agenda for change. 